So let's turn in our Bibles to, I know it says Matthew, but we're going to turn in our Bibles to Luke's gospel first. And so we're going to be looking today at Luke 1, at Matthew 1, and at John chapter 3. We won't be doing the entire chapters, I promise you. Um, we're going to be looking, though, today at three miraculous births. The first is J.B., that's John the Baptist. The second, J.C., that's Jesus Christ. The third, you and me. That in this story will be a guy named Nicodemus, but includes everyone who ever understood the words that you must be born Again, that that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So in any case, important to say uh, that a miracle by definition is more than something unusual. It's more than an unusual occurrence. It is, in fact, impossible um, unless you factor in God. He is an expert in the area of doing the impossible, for with God, we're told nothing is impossible. So for those who don't believe in God, it's always like, well, uh, bad fortune or good fortune, bad luck or good luck. And, but the reality is the Bible is filled with hundreds and hundreds of miracles, actual miracles, things that were there no God, well, there would be no miracle. And the first, of course, is creation itself, because God just said, hey, let there be, and there was. So anybody who thinks that someone else might be God or that they might someday be a God promoted by some religious systems. Listen, unless you're the creator of the universe and all things, unless you can sustain it all with the word of your power, let me tell you, you're not God, nor will you ever be. The best we're going to do, the closest we'll ever get, is to stand in God's presence, see Jesus as he is, and we're told that we will be like him. But it doesn't mean we become little gods, not even God's small g. Those are the gods of man's imagination or, or the foolish ideas of men. So in any case, actual miracles, they all began, at least in our understanding, with creation. Um, there was a creation of a perfect world. Imagine that. And, and then there were the first and only two humans besides Jesus. So there have only been three perfect humans and only two um, will fail to stay perfect. Jesus was tempted in all ways yet without sin. Jesus did always those things that pleased the Father. So um, actual miracles, they happen every day. But they're not just coincidences. They're not just good or bad fortune. They're either miracles of God or they're just delusions of men. Now, we're looking at three stories today where people, well, people very much like, but not exactly like us, experienced radical life-changing miracles. The first we find in Luke 1. I know the bulletin said we're in uh, Matthew 1. We are going over there, and then we'll spend a little time in John 3 as well. So um, let's pick up here in Luke 1. Uh, verse 5, this is what we read. It was, there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren. And they were both well advanced in years. I've learned, and you've probably noticed as well, if you are a Bible student, and if you've been in the Word and through the Word multiple times, that God often puts people in or waits until they find themselves in an impossible situation to show what he 
can do to show what he intended from the very beginning. So for this couple, it's important to know in that day and in that culture, failure to procreate, to, to have a son or a daughter, well, it brought shame and pain to both of them, but especially to the woman. Every woman in that day, in Jesus' day, wanted to bear a child and wanted a male child. Why? Because they knew in Israel from prophecies in the Old Testament that the time was at hand, that Messiah had to be coming and coming soon. So not only were they praying for a child, they were praying to be the mother of that child. Well, in any case, we continue on. Verse 8 so it was while he was serving at, as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside at the hour of incense. This was a once in a time and a lifetime opportunity for Zacharias. He'd been a priest his whole life but because there were so many and well only one is going to go in and do this thing each time it comes around well he had to be just so elated and excited but something happens as he's there inside just doing the task that God had called him to just ministering in the way that God had prepared him for an angel of the Lord appeared to him. There in verse 11, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias. This is the most common, by the way, response of people when angels appeared. And there are different kinds of angels. They're messenger angels. They're warrior angels. And since they all look like angels, whatever that looks like, we don't know. But what the, the bottom line is that these these were fearful experiences. And so uh, he's afraid and we know he was afraid because he's told not to be afraid. And you see that a lot in scripture. God wants us to know that everybody has moments, has doubts, has fears, has these things that happen to them. But he says, don't be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John. You will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, his mission to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. First thing, it says your prayer has been answered. Now, I find that interesting because at this point, we're told that they're well advanced in years beyond the childbearing years for her. And uh, while men can often produce children longer, not forever, apparently. But, but the bottom line is he'd been praying. It's my thought. I'm not saying thus says the Lord, just saying. He may have stopped praying this prayer 10 years earlier or 20 years earlier, or he could have been praying it that day. It's important to know, though, when we pray, God always hears our prayers and he always answers our prayers. He doesn't always do it on our timetable because ordinarily when I'm praying, it's because something is happening and I'm looking for an answer and I'd like it quick. Although it's why we're told not to pray for patience, not in the Bible, just by wise people who've read the Bible. Why? Because the way you get patience is through trials. So what you're really saying, Lord, put me in a trial because I really want some patience. Truth be told, we're like, I want patience and I want it now. Well, it never, never, it's never going to happen that way. So anyway, he's praying. The angel appears and he says, hey, good news. 
your prayers heard, and you're going to have a child. And, and, well, it just had to be mind-blowing to him. Well, not only does he tell them that they're going to have this miraculous experience of having a child in their old age. And listen, if you're older, you're probably thinking, yeah, it would be a miracle, but that would be the beginning of a whole different set of trials. Because raising kids when you're young or when you're middle-aged, that's something. Raising kids when you're, well, beyond those ages, well, that's what they're going to be dealing with. We're given, told that Zach's given the miraculous nature of John's birth. And, and so he tells them that the Spirit's going to come upon him and such. And, and then, of course, his name, John, his sanctification, he's not to do this and not to drink that or not to uh, have this. And then his power, it will be the power of the Holy Spirit. This is oh so important because in all three stories that we'll consider today, the work is the work of the Holy Spirit. The power is the power of the Holy Spirit. So he'll be filled with the Spirit, we're told, even from his mother's womb. And then we know his mission and that's important as well. So that nothing's left the chance here. God waits till they can't have a child and then he gives them a child so they'll know this child is a gift of God. And by the way, every child is a gift of God. The difference is they knew it because they knew there was no way this could happen naturally. So every child, and, and especially this child, um, has a plan and a purpose. And, and so God has all that. He, you're, the mission he has for you, he's already laid it out. He's already planned it out. He's purposed it all. All we have to do is say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then we have to walk in obedience and, and rely on his power. Well, in any case, Zacharias has a question, and, and his question begins with the word how. We're going to see that that happens in each of the three stories. That, that the first thing that comes to mind when God says he's about to do something impossible is how's that going to work exactly, right? So he says, how shall I know this? How will I experience this? Verse 18, for I'm an old man and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their own time. There's always consequence of sin and when he says how, he's actually expressing a doubt, his doubt, that such a thing can even happen. And there's an irony in this because Elderly people in the Old Testament, Abe and Sarah come to mind. I think he was 100 and she was 90 when they had their first promised child. So, so it's like, it's not like they never heard of anything like this. It's just, they never thought anything like this could happen to them. And we get that. We know God can do anything. Nothing's too hard for the Lord, but we don't expect him to do just anything or that one thing that we really need him to do. Now, it's interesting that, that he actually is muted. And so we know what mute is because we have a button to do that today on our phones and such. But, but in my day, and it's probably true for most of you, uh, we had a saying, and it's like, not another word out of your mouth. Some of you parents remember saying that not that long ago even, but not another word out of your mouth. The only difference is when you say that to a child or someone else, well, they can still talk. This is a judgment of God. And so he's told, you're not going to say another word. And then that, that's judgment, by the way. And it's a righteous judgment because God never judges unrighteously. He always does what's right and pure and holy in his sight. So the angel, and he's representing God, remember? He says, okay, you're gonna be mute until, 
And this is, this is oh so good. Mute and not able to speak until, until what? The day these things take place. I love that so much because his unbelief did not stop God from accomplishing his stated purpose. He says, we're not gonna hear another word out of you until you are praising me. He doesn't say it here, but that's what ends up happening. Until you're praising me for what I've done. And so uh, he's going to come out in a moment and he's not going to be able to talk and he's not going to be able to talk. Think about this for a moment. What would it be like if you couldn't talk for the rest of today? For whatever reason, no talking at all. But what about a month or a year or how well? How long does it take for a baby? It's going to be at least nine months. I'm thinking it won't be too far in when he doesn't start praying for an early birth, right? But he can't speak at all. If he opens his mouth, nothing's going to come out. And um, I think God, you know, I'm, I, I wouldn't be surprised if God were to do that to some of us and just say, I don't want to hear another word out of you until... And again, I love that word because it reminds us again and again and again, he always does what he says he's going to do. So the judgments because of unbelief, the, the fulfillment of the promises because God keeps all his promises. And then we find in verse 21, the people waited outside and, and they waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them. They perceived he'd seen a vision in the temple for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. So it's charades now that he comes out and he's like, well, all of the stuff that he would have, you know, you know, none of this is going to work. And, and so another thing happens is when he gets home and needs to tell his wife, well, that's going to be a problem too. But somehow he gets the message over that, hey, we're going to have a baby. Maybe he just had a goofy grin on his face, you know. There's no way to know, but, but he could have just been, had that gleam in his eye. And she's like, I haven't seen that in 10 years. What's up? Anyway, um, as soon as it was, we read in verse 23, as soon as the days of his service were completed, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and she hid herself five months saying, thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. See, there's that that shame, that, that suffering of, of being unable to do something that, well, everybody else seemed to be able. And for, for God's purposes, he had withheld this blessing to make a point. And I want to be sure to say, he may be withholding something from you. Probably not that, but even that could be the case. If that's happening and you know, well, everybody else, and, and, but not us. There's a reason. And when you discover it, it's going to be as radical as this is. It's going to be something beyond your imagination, beyond your, your hoping or dreaming or, or praying or planning. Well, our second miraculous birth follows on the heels. And we'll stay here in uh, Luke for a moment, and then we'll jump over to Matthew. But a uh, second miraculous birth is, is that of... Um, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior. It's a similar process, same angel, angelic visitation, but a very different situation. Six months, we read, verse 26. Now in the six months, six months of what? Six months after Elizabeth got pregnant. So these two are related. It's going to say so, but just so you know, six months have passed since that angelic visitation. And now the angel Gabriel is sent to, by God to a city in Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, rejoice, O highly favored one, the one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among 
women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. Same thing that he said to Zacharias. Why? Because being in the presence of of an angelic creation of God, it always bred fear in their heart. So do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth the son and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and be called the son of the highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary said, verse 34, to the angel, how? Now, this is a very different how. Same word, but it's how. And when Zacharias asked it, it was in unbelief. Mary's interested in the process and that she makes that clear. She wants to know how will this actually work because, you know, I have family. It's, a, you know, I've got, it's a holiday. I'm going to be with them and they're going to want to know what exactly happened here. So how can this be since I do not know a man? That means to know him sexually, physically, and in that way. And the angel answered and said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. There it is. Zacharias was told that John would operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now Mary's told it will be the Holy Spirit who comes upon you. And the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now... Indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who was called barren. So one older woman who was barren, one younger woman who's not yet married. She's betrothed. She's espoused. That's an important term because, well, in that day, all marriages at least in in that culture, were arranged. And it wasn't the kids getting together and talking to their parents. It were the parents getting together and saying, okay, we'll make a deal. Your daughter, my son, we'll have all the holidays together. It's going to be great. And that's how that worked out. So it's so important to know that, that this arrangement was made and it was a legally binding arrangement so that If someone wanted out of it, there had to be a writing of divorce. Now, they hadn't consummated the marriage, so they weren't married in the sense that we understand it. It's it's less than a marriage, but it's more than, than an engagement because they were legally and spiritually bound to one another because the contract, the covenant of marriage had been made and it would be fulfilled on the day that they would stand with friends and family and then they would consummate the marriage sexually and the hope of course would always be that there would be a child and so he says um the holy spirit will come upon you the power of the highest will overshadow you therefore that holy one who is to be born will be called the son of god Elsewhere, the only begotten son of God. We are sons and daughters of God by adoption and by the new birth. Jesus was the only son of God that that was that inherently. He was with the father. He was like the father. They were both God, God the father, God the son, God the Holy Spirit. Until he came, emptying himself, became one of us. But he entered this world through childbirth. So there's no experience that we could ever have that that he hadn't experienced. Even temptation and the worst of it, it says he was tempted in all ways, yet without sin. He was tempted in all ways, but he did always those things that pleased the father. So for with God, verse 37, nothing will be impossible. That's one you want to memorize. It's short, 
Verse 37, with God, nothing will be impossible. He is the God of impossibilities. When we get to the end of our resources and we cry out saying, I give up, I can never do this. He jumps in because he was waiting to hear that the whole time. I can't do it. I'll never make it. This will never work out. Then God just steps in for with him, nothing is impossible. Now you may be in, at least in your life and in your understanding, an impossible situation today. If that's the case, know this, God isn't surprised by it. He may not have put you in it. You might have just made some decisions that led you down a road you never should have gone down. And now you find yourself kind of trapped. Know this, God is still Faithful to his every promise. He will show up. Pray. Seek him. Trust him. Because he is the God of the impossible. So all that brings us to this. Um, While he, oh, he decided. And this is so important. I almost, you know, jumped ahead. We don't want to do that today. Verse 19 says, Joseph, her husband, Being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example was minded to put her away secretly. So I think I read to you that before they came together, that word before is important because it suggests something that will be confirmed later. And that is there would be natural children born to Joseph and Mary. And Jesus had brothers. We're studying the book of James right now on our normal Sunday schedule. And uh, James is a half brother of Jesus, one who was born to Joseph and Mary. So that before is important. And they'll use another word that um, emphasizes the same reality. So she's found pregnant. Joseph's a just man. That means right in the sight of God. And you would think in the sight of men. He didn't want to make her a public example How would you make someone who you thought, and there was, I don't know what else he could have thought, that that she's been with someone else. It's, It's unimaginable to him because he knows the pure and sweet and holy girl that she is, that he's planning on spending his life with. So, so he, he's just, and justice would say, that she could be taken out and stoned for this. Can you imagine that? In a culture that thinks it's no big deal, people sleep around, so what? In that day, sleeping around was called fornication. And in that day, sleeping around, if you were a spouse, that was adultery because you were already promised to that person and it was a coveted relationship, a covetend <laughs> Can't say the word, but it's all good. You get it. Anyway, uh, he a public example would have required him to go out, say she has been with another man and that she deserves to be stoned. And, and the most radical thing about it is that, well, he would have to cast the first stone. And while he certainly could not understand how this could be, he loved her far too much to make a public example of her. So he minded to put her away secretly. Those words translate our word for divorce. And so he was going to write her a certificate of divorce and she was going to go and have the baby somewhere else. And while he's thinking about all this, verse 20 says, behold, an angel of the Lord, that's Gabriel again, appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. There it is again, the work of the Spirit of God, doing what can never happen in the natural, in the flesh. And she will bring forth the Son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Like John, God names Jesus. Jesus, and he shares his mission, the most important mission in all of human history. He will save his people from their sins. He tells us who will, speaks to the certainty of that reality, 
It says he will save, that's his mission. And by the way, not save them from the Romans or save them from poverty or save them. No, to save them from their sin. The one thing no one else could do for them, but someone had to do or they would have died in their sins. So we have the the who, the certainty, his mission, and who are, are his people, by the way? His people are all who believe in him, all who put faith in him. You're not a child of God because you believe there is a God or because you pray to God. You're a child of God if you're born again of his spirit. And, well, and, oh, and you're a child of God if you're adopted into his family. And he does both when we confess him as Lord and Savior and give our lives to him. So in any case, he will save his people from that, their sin. Um, Other blessings will flow from that first reality, but they will never be ours apart from him forgiving, freeing, cleansing, and beginning a transformation that ends when we stand before him at his very throne in glory. We see him as he is. We will be like him, as I already mentioned, not small gods or God small g. We will be like him and that we will be holy in heart and mind and thought and deed. We will be perfect because we'll never have a sinful thought or never have to say, please forgive me for those words or those actions. So in any case, all of this brings us to this. All this, verse 22, is done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. It's so important. We've been studying Genesis, Exodus, you know, Leviticus, Numbers, and now Deuteronomy. And one of the things that set Israel apart from all the nations is that God was with them. Before he gave them the law, he was with them. After he gave them the law, he was with them. And so we have that same reality, only it's way more radical for us. Why? Because while he was with them, he has taken up residence in us in the person of the Holy Spirit. If you're a Christian, a born-again Christian, born again of his spirit, the spirit of the true and living God lives in you. The same spirit, we're told, that raised Jesus from the dead and dwells every one of you. And if not, you're not like on some path and someday maybe this or that. You're, You're born again of the spirit or you're dead in trespasses and sin. And if you're dead in trespasses and sin and you realize that today could be the day, that you open your heart to him, that you confess your need for him and for his forgiveness, that you find life everlasting in Christ Jesus. So all this done, that it might be fulfilled, spoken of through the prophet. I read it, but I want to read it and keep the context going. Behold, the virgin shall be with the child, bear a son. They'll call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. He was the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till. That word till is important because earlier on, it suggested that there would be other children. Now it's saying flat out, he didn't have that relationship with her physically until she'd brought forth her firstborn son, And they called his name Jesus. Well, our third and final miraculous birth actually involves millions and millions of sinners saved by grace. And it's John 3, so so go over there um, with me and... It will be the last last move we make. I made it about as easy as you could get, right? A little Luke, a little Matthew, a little John. Mark's probably saying, hey, what about me? Um, but anyway, John chapter 3, 
perhaps one of the most familiar and needs to be chapters uh, in John's gospel, though every chapter is so radical to read and, and comprehend and deal with. John 3 um, records the story, and we have little time left. I'll summarize some of it, but you must read it all later. I, I, I encourage you, I implore you, read all of Matthew's teaching related to, it's all grouped together, teaching related to the birth of Christ, and then do the same in Luke, and then we're in John 3, because this is, this is somebody who you would think would have understood all these things, turns out he didn't understand it at all, and so um, Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews, he comes to Jesus with questions, and his first question is this. He says, we know you're a teacher come from God for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And we'll pick up in John 3, 3 as far as reading here. But important to say that, that John picks seven signs out of the many. And, and a sign is, is meant to point to something else. When you're going down the, the street and, uh, and you see a stop sign, that's telling you it's time to stop. When you see a, a sign and it's got a curvy thing or it's showing you there's a, you know, a, a drop off ahead, that sign is meant for your you're good. And, and that's what John does. He picks seven signs of out of all the things Jesus did. And um, I'll share them with you sometime, but not today. You can look them up. They're all there. And there are hundreds, by the way, of miracles in scripture. And Jesus responsible for so many in the, the time he lived upon the earth. Well, Jesus answers Nicodemus, and, and we know him as Nick at night, right? He comes to Jesus at night, and he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So what's he saying? That you and you and you and you and you and you and everybody you know or ever will know, everyone who knows you, they must be born of God the the spirit and 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 so um or he says you will die in your sins can't see the kingdom of god must be born from above so nicodemus uses the same word that was used uh earlier by john and and our, and then or excuse me zacharias and the same word used by mary and in this case He's like Mary. He wants to understand the process, but he takes things a little too literally. He says, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? That's almost cartoonish in a, you know, the image that comes. It could never happen, and he should know that. And so he's doing, well, we're to take the scripture literally, not if it's clearly figurative. And this is one of those places, but it's, it's more than figurative because he's talking about a reality that if we don't embrace it, if we don't experience it, we will forever be separated from the God who made us and loves us and sent his son to suffer and die for us. Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Some read this and don't read on, and, and, and they're like, well, born of water, that must be baptism. No, baptism is something you do as a public testimony that something's happened to you. And, and so born of water, he's going to clarify this, but I'm just bringing it to your attention. It's talking about a physical birth, a natural birth, and that's something every person here and every person you know has experienced. So that which is born of, unless one's born of water and the spirit, why the spirit? Because the spirit gives life eternal. The spirit seals us until the day of our perfection. It says redemption, but it means when we stand before him and we will always need the power of the spirit. But he says, unless you're born of water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. So we've had the first birth 
every person here. My question to you, have you had the second? Have you been born again spiritually? Because that's what Jesus is telling Nicodemus is an absolute necessity, absolutely necessary. So do not marvel, he said, when I said to you, you must be born again. He gives an illustration. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. And Nicodemus for the second time answered and said to him, how, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said, are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak and testify. We speak what we know and testify what we've seen. And you do not receive our witness. If I've told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven heaven so listen John 6 Jesus came down from heaven he says it over and over and over and over a chapter well worth reading to get a handle on how Jesus set things up well the father set things up and Jesus concurred and the Holy Spirit participated but he had to come down in order to make all this happen. He had to be born of a virgin for all of this to happen. And then he says, taking us back to um, the Old Testament and to a time where God's people did something that, well, they were professionals at this. They weren't amateurs at all. They murmured and complained continuously. They found themselves thirsty. They murmured against Moses and God. They were hungry. They murmured against Moses and God. Whatever went wrong, they blamed Moses and they blamed God. And so at one point for one particular sin that was grievous in the sight of God, he sent serpents among them and the serpents were biting them and they were dying. And so they go to Moses, those who were still alive and freaking out. And they said, what are you going to do? And he goes to God and says, what am I going to do? And he says, make a bronze serpent and hold it up. And whoever looks on that serpent will live. Now, like so many things in scripture, if, if you read that story to kids, they totally just accept it. If you read it to adults, they're like, oh, yeah. So how would looking at a bronze serpent save anyone? I don't know, how would slaying a lamb and putting blood on the doorpost and lintels of the house? I mean, you just painted the house and now you're blooding it up. Your wife's like, hey, what are you doing? And listen, how would that save your firstborn? It saved the firstborn because that's what God said to do. And the same with looking on the bronze serpent. So at this particular point, Jesus grabs hold of that image, familiar to them, by the way, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. But he's talking here about the cross. Not songs that lift him up, though we have that. He's talking about lifted up. Whoever looks at him, believes in him, believes the Lord who sent them, the Father who sent him. And there'll be life and forgiveness and adoption and transformation and fruit. So he says that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Twice he says, hey, here's the key. Believe in him and you will not perish. Trust in him, you will not perish. You won't die in your sin. You have a everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. And there's a simple reason for that. We were already condemned. We are self-condemned because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God, everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He says he didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So for any and all who are here and you've not yet given your life to the Lord Jesus, tune in. Everyone should tune in because you should share this with somebody. You should share it today if possible or tomorrow when you're celebrating. And, and, and 
Everyone needs to know why. Everyone's going to stand before God and either be welcomed in or sent away. And so he says, he who believes in him, verse 18, is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. Not that men couldn't understand or they couldn't see how a God of love could let this happen or do that. He said, this is the real crux of the matter. This is the foundation of the problem. That the light has come into the world. Not just light, the light. That's Jesus, you see. Follow me, he says, and you will not walk in darkness. Light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil and everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they've been done in God. So for those of us who know the Lord, we're serving the Lord, we're growing in the Lord, we're empowered by the Lord, we know what he's called us to do, then it's a simple, simple task. If you know what he's called you to do, just do it. If you know that he's gifted and empowered you to teach, teach. And if you're like, well, there isn't anybody to teach. There's people everywhere. Say, hey, do you ever read the Bible? You want to know how it works? Let me open it up with you. Just do it. You'll be surprised how much you know. And they'll be shocked because they don't know anything. Anyway, bottom line is you're either in the light or you're in the darkness. You either have life or you're dead in trespasses and sin. You're either walking in truth or you are deceived. And unless you come to Jesus, you will forever be separated from all that he's purposed and planned for everyone who'll trust in him. Lord, I thank you first for all my brothers and sisters and for the great privilege of being able to minister your word, to open it and, and just glory in it, to dwell on it, knowing, Lord, your word's alive and powerful. And it's not like ours, Lord. Your word is a two-edged sword. It cuts to the very core and heart of our beings. And so, Lord, I am grateful beyond words that you've enabled me and used me to share your word. But, Lord, will you just burn into every mind and, and, and every heart today that your word is alive and powerful. And our exposition of it, it's our best effort to fill in the blanks, looking at the history, dealing with the grammar and intricacies of these things. But Lord, your word's alive. Your word's powerful. Your word is transformative. So I pray we would just know it and, and live as if we really understood it and if you're here and you've given your life to the Lord then it's a simple thing hey live your life for the Lord he died for your sins he was buried he rose again he says die to self and live for me and if you've never said Jesus come into my life be my Lord be my savior forgive my every sin it's called repentance it's more than remorse though remorse would be a part because anyone who's well, done something really bad and, and God calls all that stuff sin, anyone who sinned against him or man and, and caught, well, there's going to be some remorse if it's just that I can't believe it. I'm so sorry I got caught. But, but repentance is so much more than that. Repentance is literally turning from the direction you're going Walking in darkness, walking in deception, walking, uh, you know, without him, turning and going the other way, walking toward him, walking in light, walking in love, walking with Jesus. So he says it, and I would have never thought it. You're with me or you're against me. You're for me or you're against him. And so he's not saying you who are somewhere in between. I want you to think about this. He's saying you're against me right now, but you can be for me and know I'm for you. And that while every head's up and every eye's open, if you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus and you're ready to do that today, I'd ask you to raise your hand, hold it high. And if you'll do that, then look up and catch my eye so I can pray for you and pray with you. 
And that the miracle that began the moment we trusted in him will take place in your heart. You will literally be transformed from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. You will be sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And he will begin a work in you. The work he's always planned for you to do. Anyone this hour, anyone this service, if so, let me see that hand. And we'll pray together. Maybe you're logged on. Maybe you're listening in. Maybe you're sitting there right now thinking, man, if I, if I do it, it's like, what am I going to say to people? And how is it going to work? Or maybe I'm too sinful. Or maybe I'm not bad as this guy seems to think I am. No, listen, no one's too sinful and no one's, you know, better than really when we stand before God. It's just sinners. He doesn't see, he doesn't see degrees of sin. He sees sinners and saints. And you either are a saint because you've given your life to him or you ain't and you're dead in trespasses and sin. So just another moment to make a decision and, and understand no decision is a no decision. But you can say yes to Jesus right here, right now. And I've been waiting because I'm convinced there are some of you that you really in your heart want to do that very thing. Anyone this hour, anyone this service. Lord, you've called us to proclaim you a world of darkness, to tell them there's light, a world of just depravity, to tell them there's love, a world of confusion and pain, to tell them that there's joy and, and peace and all the good things that you've purposed for mankind, but it's all in your son and through your son. And so we thank you, Lord, for loving us, for choosing us, for blessing us. And we ask you, Lord, to remind us that you've called us to be available to you, that you might use us, especially in this season. And we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's stand for a last song together, you guys.